I'm Mariette Di Cristina, and I'm Dean of the Boston University College of Communication. I'm also a COM alum and the parent of a recent BU grad. Welcome to today's event, Sports and the Work of Anti-Racism. It was almost five years ago, Colin Kaepernick used his platform and knelt on the field to shed light on racism and injustice. Five years later, where are we? Where's the world of sports when it comes to racial reckoning that's been happening in America? How do we continue to build on the momentum and foundation that Kaepernick, Ron James, and several other athletes have created? But what does this monumental shift mean for sports journalists, team owners, fans, and others? During this special Com Talks event sponsored by the College of Communication and the Boston University Alumni Association, we'll hear from experts surrounding the relationship between sports and anti-racism. This event is being recorded and will be available later on Calm website and its YouTube channel, as well as BU platforms. There'll be plenty of time later to ask your own questions of our expert panelists. And when you do so, please do put them in the Q&A at the bottom of your screen rather than the chat function. Now I'd love to introduce you to today's special speakers. First, let's welcome Marissa Mosley, a grad of CAS04, who is women's head basketball coach at Boston University. Rissa is the eighth head coach and first alum in program history. In her first season at the helm of the Terriers, Mosley is named the first Patriot League coach of the year in program history and was just the second coach in the program's 45 year history to be named the conference coach of the year. Prior to being named head coach of the Terriers, Marissa was an assistant coach at the University of Connecticut helping the Huskies claim five national championships while reaching the final four all nine seasons. Prior to serving as an assistant coach at UConn, um, Mosley filled the same capacity at Minnesota. In addition to coaching, Marissa served as a member of the University of Connecticut Diversity Council. And additionally, she was a member of the Student Athlete Development Diversity Committee and was the athletic department's liaison to the Office of Diversity. Marissa has also worked a one-year stint as production assistant at ESPN in Bristol, Connecticut, where she served as creative contributor to shows such as Sports Center, ESPN News, and ABC News One. Welcome, Marissa. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, it's so awesome to have you here. Now let's say hello to Kevin Merida. Kevin is a graduate of the College of Communication and senior vice president at ESPN and editor-in-chief of The Undefeated a multimedia platform that explores the intersections of race, sports, and culture. During his tenure at ESPN, Kevin has also overseen the investigative news enterprise unit, as well as the television shows E60 and Outside the Lines, and he's chaired ESPN's editorial board. Before launching The Undefeated in 2016, Kevin spent 22 years at the Washington Post as a congressional correspondent national political reporter, long form feature writer, magazine columnist, and senior editor, editor in several roles. He led the national staff of, for four years during the Obama presidency and was managing editor overseeing news and features coverage for three years. During his tenure as managing editor, he helped lead the post to four Pulitzer Prizes. Kevin is co-author of Supreme Discomfort, the Divided Soul of Clarence Thomas, and Obama, the Historic Campaign in Photographs. He is a contributor to and editor of the anthology Being a Black Man at the Corners of Progress and Peril, which is based on an award-winning Washington Post series. Kevin's honors include being named Journalist of the Year in 2000 by the National Association of Black Journalists, receiving the Missouri Honors Medal for Distinguished Service in Journalism in 2018, and receiving the NABJ's Chuck Stone Lifetime Achievement Award in 2020. He's also a member of the Pulitzer Prize Board. Kevin, it's so great to have you here. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Dean. Thank you. Now let's say hello to our moderator. Sherrod Blakely is a lecturer at the Boston University College of Communication, and he's co-host of the A-List podcast after having spent 11 years as a Boston Celtics insider for NBC Sports Boston. He's also an NBA writer for Bleacher Report, winner of Boston.com's A-List Celtics Reporter of the Year Award in 2011, 
um, Sherrod has established himself as a leading voice on the Celtics and the NBA, which includes appearances on national sports networks, such as NBA TV. Prior to Boston, Sherrod covered the Detroit Pistons for the award-winning MLive.com. He also covered ACC football and basketball for the Raleigh News and Observer in North Carolina. Sherrod, who taught journalism course for high school students shortly after college, continues to do his part in helping to shape and develop the next wave of journalists as the chair of the National Association of Black Journalists Sports Task Force, which awards scholarships and internships to exceptionally talented journalists. In addition, he is member of the APSE Scholarship Committee. We're so happy to have him here at COM. Welcome, Sherrod, and now I pass the virtual mic over to you. Thank you, thank you so much. I appreciate that warm and frankly, not deserving uh, acknowledgement there. Uh, I, I feel like that, you know, that, that, that running back who just looks in front of him and sees Tom Brady, like, why am I here? Uh, I'm just glad to be on the team. Uh, with, with Kevin Merida and Coach Mosley. Uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for, for being part of this and really uh, affording a lot of folks out there an opportunity to just get some insight into something that is very near and dear to the hearts of a lot of us. Uh, I just want to jump right into it because the sooner we can kind of get you guys giving them feedback, the sooner they can give us feedback on what their questions are. So this, this is to both of you, and I'm going to start with, with you, Coach Mosley. What role do you see sports playing in the anti-racism movement, specifically from the lens of a leader of young women who, as we both know, have a different set of challenges that they deal with in addition to the topic that we're, we're discussing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think for us um, as a leader, I look at it as I'm really kind of a professor on the court, right? Like this is my, the, the court is our classroom. And so we try to teach lessons um, every day um, when we're in practice, but also off the court, especially um, in this past year, we had so much time um, as the country was going through an awakening of sorts um, to really take an opportunity to share and educate my players um, around what it means to be an anti-racist and also around the history of kind of why our country is the way it is, how we got here, and also how we can kind of move forward um, and turn the page and what their responsibility is, right? We all have platforms, I think oftentimes there's a misnomer that in, unless you're famous um, or you have a you know a blue check, you can't necessarily um, comment or try to um, affect change. And I just, I don't subscribe to that. I, I really believe that we all have platforms um, because we all have voices and we all have the opportunity to have conversations. And um, that's our responsibility. Um, you know, if you know more, you do more. If you know better, you do better. And so um, I really want to encourage and I really try to empower my young women to, to take another step. And especially as you mentioned, you know, my black female student athletes, um, you know, there's another layer to it, right? We're not just women, uh, you're a black woman in America, um, the way the world sees you and where you kind of uh, sit on the totem pole of, of, of life. And so trying to make sure that they understand that there is an additional responsibility that comes with that. And, and Kevin, for you, as someone who's a leader in, in media, uh, what does that look like? Uh, what, what, how do you see the anti-racism movement playing out as far as what you do and, and the people that you lead and, and that you work with on a regular basis? Well, first, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be with my coach, you know, the BU and glad she's here uh, coaching my alma mater. And, and, and I'm glad you're there, Sherrod, because I graduated from that school. So I'm glad, you know, to see you. So part of that is representation, you know. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, I think the thing I can do as a leader is, is to, first of all, we, we tell stories, you know, you t tell, tell untold stories, you know, uh, have people see us better, you know, not see just a corner of the world, you know, um, but all of it, you know, and, and those of us, you know, look, look, the three of us, people who look like us, tell stories that in, in ways that um, present, and let's just take the sports landscape for, for one, um, beyond the courts and fields and to show athletes as 
as thinking people um, with interests and with emotions and uh, with the same kind of um, often problems and, and struggles and challenges that everybody else has. Um, widen that, that, that lens. I think the other, the other thing that you can do is um, give opportunity. You know, it's one of the, the biggest things that, that shrink the gap of how we're seeing this country is, is we need to have opportunity because, you know, we, we know that, that their brilliance exists everywhere, but sometimes only some people get the opportunity to be brilliant, uh, to show their brilliance. And so, you know, as a leader, I think those are, those are two of the biggest things, storytelling and, and opportunity. How has that evolved over time, Kevin, uh, as, as far as that, that leadership and, and opportunity that you, you speak of? Because it just from my perspective, it, it seems that there, the opportunities have been amplified to some degree, but those who aren't necessarily on board with those opportunities, their voices and their presence seems to be amplified as well. Yeah. How, do, how do you see the kind of the evolution of, of those two points that you brought up? Well, I, I'll, I'll say something that, we, look, we, we know we're not anywhere near where we need to be. And, and I'll say this just as, a, you know, as an executive at ESPN and in the Walt Disney Company, I haven't always been an executive. You know, um, I haven't always been a leader. A lot of my career, I was out reporting. I was writing stories and I was doing other things. The, the more you get into the senior leaderships um, of America, anywhere you are, the more you realize how that is literally everything, you know, the, make the ability to make the decisions, you know, the final decisions or close to the finals is literally everything. That's how we really change the, the whole landscape of this country. Um, that's where, where power is wielded and, 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 uh, and prosecuted. And, and so I, I think that that cannot ever be underestimated. Um, and so we're, we're nowhere near where we need to be just, just there. Um, also think that bravery is an underestimated quality. Uh, and we, we, we need more bravery. You know, we need to encourage that, uh, which to me, we sometimes think about bravery often in the, in the context of, of going to fight wars and, and being on the front lines of the pandemic and, and, and being a firefighter and a policeman. Uh, I think going into school sometimes if you're a, a teacher in certain neighborhoods, it's bravery. But I think we need to have that like in our, in our regular lives, you know, where we are in our workplaces. And I think it's hard to foster that, you know, particularly when I, young people, when you're in an environment and you look around, there's nobody like you and you're trying to represent yourself authentically. You're trying to speak truth to power. You want to say something. It's hard to, to muster that courage you, because you first have to have enough confidence. And where do you get confidence? usually get confidence with success. Success breeds confidence, which is back to opportunity. And, and so to me, that, that's where we really need to kind of change to attack the thing I think you're getting at. Sherrod, we need bravery. And, and I know that we, we have it in place, but we need to encourage it uh, in, in our young people too. Yeah, and, and, and Coach Mosley, along those same lines, how do you do that? within the, the, the confines of, of your role as a coach, who obviously you're trying to develop and cultivate the, these young women, these student athletes, you're trying to win games as well. How do you kind of really mix in that, that need that we're talking about within the, within the framework of what you're trying to do in your role? Well, I, I totally agree with what Kevin said. Um, you know, the opportunity piece is so huge. Um, if I didn't have the opportunity to go work at UConn and have and be a part of such a storied program, um, you know, then and I didn't if I didn't have the opportunity to come play basketball at BU on a scholarship, right? I wasn't coming to BU unless I got a scholarship to play here. Um, you know, at the time it was forty two thousand dollars a year. You know, that ages me how much it costs now. Um, but you know, the reality is all those opportunities led to me being able to be in this spot. And so I, I agree, the representation piece is so key right so that my players see a black female who's doing it but in order to do the work that we're talking about I have to be successful I can't come around and we know this right because of where our, our country still is I can't come around and be carrying a big stick and I don't have the the, the record or the cachet to back it up like no I'm, I'm winning I'm doing my job well 
And I also feel very confident and very passionate about this, right? And so I knew that in order to be vocal, and I always have been in my life, but in order to be vocal, you have to also be successful. Um, and so, and, and I, I couldn't, I mean, I wrote that down that success breeds confidence because it's so true. Um, the more successful you are, the more willing you are to kind of put your neck out there. And you know that in order to be a change maker, you're going to have to risk some things. You know, we talk about allies through all this work. And I think um, one of my, our, our uh, you know, fellow professors here at BU, Saida Grundy said, we actually have to be co-conspirators, right? You have to be willing to risk everything to actually make change happen. And so um, I'm trying to kind of uh, not only empower, but to be the example of that for my players and to really them to understand whether you look like me or you're, you know, a white female, um, you still have a, a, a responsibility, but you also have an opportunity. If you do really well, then you can speak out on what you really feel passionate about yeah when, when you just just listen to you coach Mosey it, it, it takes my mind back to something that you know I, when I was in high school I thought that you know this is just my guidance counselor just telling me some nonsense because he just needed to tell me this nonsense <laughs> but he would tell me he, he would repeatedly tell me about Gandhi and about being the change that you want to see uh and, and, and when, as a 17 year old I'm thinking like whatever dude whatever but as I got older it it slowly but surely sunk in that that's exactly what we all need to be when you talk about being anti-racist, when you talk about wanting to bring about change. And, and I'm just, you know, M M Coach Mosley, if you can just shed a little light on, is there an experience or a moment in your life that, that when you reflect upon it, it, it was kind of one of those, it was a, it was an age, a, game-changing moment, if you will, I guess, either in your life or the life of someone around you as it relates to, to race and things of that nature? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, you know, I grew up, my mom is white, my dad is um, black, he's from, he's an immigrant though, he's from South America, and so I was already um, different right from the beginning, um, and then I went to a predominantly white um, Jewish high school, uh, well, schooling, first through 12th grade, I was bused there from Springfield to Longmeadow, Mass, and so immediately I was, um, you know, I was in the minority, I mean, I was one of maybe two or three in, in every class all the way up until high school, um, and so I think that really did kind of, um, you know, formulate who I was as a person. I mean, my mom was very much of anybody who's watching this knows my mom. She's like, the world sees you as black. That's what you are. And that's how we're going to go. She came to our sixth grade class and taught the, them about Kwanzaa. Okay. This is my mother. So for me to be as vocal as I am, it's, I got, it started at home that I was able to, you know, feel confident about that. Um, but I remember in fourth grade being called the N-word on the playground. And, you know, I, I marched right into the, you know, my teacher and I said, I need to see Dr. Seslick. He was our, our principal. He had told me when I came to that school, if I had ever had an issue, I need to, you know, speak to him directly. And so my teacher's like, Marissa, what's the going on? I said, I need to speak to Dr. Seslick. And so already, right, there was something in me that understood, A, that's not okay, but B, I need to make sure that this is addressed. And so then I can try to be a change maker there, right? This, this little girl and her parents need to know that's not okay. And so I think that was unfortunately a fourth grade, a formative moment, but I think it also gave me, um, you know, a, a, an experience that I said, okay, this, I'm not going to allow that anyone to speak to me or anyone else around me um, in that way without at least voicing, you know, what I feel about it. Yeah. And Kevin, just the same question to you. Can you can you recall a moment in your in your life, your career? You know, it. it wow, there's so many moments. I I mean, I think back to when you're when you're young and you're still, you know, dreaming about what you could be. I mean, I was in the first class of busing in Prince George's County, mm. which is saying something. You know, to show you how late we were were at Prince George's County, and and we got bus from our neighborhood school, which was all black and, and our school and, and really in the middle of the, in the school year, because the judge was so upset and frustrated by the slow pace of change in Prince George's County. He, he made people literally, he, he said, you got to get a, a plan together, told the, 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 the school's system was a product of NAACP suit and that we want to, to change schools in January, you know? And so, we had started school and we, we all got bust and we were a small percentage. And so all of the neighborhood rivalries and the things when you're in your black neighborhood, we all kind of 
came together and we go to this predominantly white school and, and this sense of really, you know, not necessarily feeling welcome and wanted out of your environment, um, trying to make your way in that school, how you were seen, uh, it was really an eye-opening experience, you know, and, and, you know, some people in, in our group, we did, didn't make it, you know, some people just, that's where they fell off, you know, uh, that, that sense of, of what school is beyond just the classroom. It's, it's the community and, and that sense. And so, you know, that's how I really found journalism. You know, for me, it did work because I, I found a, a white teacher that refused to, to allow me to push away from like staying after school and push me to be in writing contests and all that stuff, which was great for me. But I just saw that experience is that it, was, it didn't work for everybody. And, and even then, you know, you're at this school, some people are helping you, but you know, I remember guidance counselor, I applied to BU, I got into BU and, and telling me certain schools I shouldn't try to, you know, trying to kind of tamp down my expectations and limit my dreams, right? And so, you know, I always kind of remember that that was in the early beginning and it just showed you how sometimes you have these experiences and, you know, imagine how many kids have been told they couldn't be some of our kids. And so yeah. that was really uh, like a defining thing for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I, when you, it, as you ended that, Kevin, I, I immediately thought of myself. Uh, and, and coming up, I, there were most of my educators fell into one of two buckets. They were either dream snatchers or dream catchers. And I was fortunate enough to have more dream catchers trying to catch me up to the dreams that they felt I should be thinking about. Um, you know, I, I first grade, my teacher thought that I wasn't suited to go into the second grade and wanted me to fail. And then my parents said, no, you're just going to work harder. Yeah. Two years later, they want me to skip a grade. I went from being ready to be flunked, ready to be repeating a grade to being able to skip a grade. Uh, and when I tell people I went to Syracuse, uh, they ask me, why'd you go to Syracuse? It's a great J school. I went there because Syracuse paid me to go there. Yeah. I went there because they gave me a full academic ride. Uh, every single school I applied to, that's that was literally the one criteria they had to have in common. Uh, and I, I did that because I had people who invested in me. I had allies who believed in me that I could do that. And for, from the 10th grade on up, I it was a no-brainer that somebody was going to cut a check for me to go to school. <laughs> it was going to be academic or it was going to be football. Somebody was going to do it. And I was fortunate enough to be in a situation where I had to choose between the two. And that's a, that's a blessing. Uh, and Again, getting back to our theme about, uh, about racism and in sports, you still have to negotiate and navigate through some of those perils to get where you want to get to. And along that journey, you're going to have to have allies uh, that have your back and have your support and can encourage you when you don't feel encouraging of yourself. Yeah. And, you know, Kevin, I, I wanted to um, ask you about just we live in a time where, where there's a lot, of, a lot of things are being said about this, that and the other. And when you hear the argument from those who spout racist thoughts and ideologies, they're simply exercising their First Amendment rights. How do you combat that? How do you view that, that argument? Well, you know, one, one thing that you, you mentioned something that got me to thinking about a current topic. And, you know, let's take coaching, you know, and it's something that coach will relate to. So we get into a period where Somehow, there doesn't seem to be, despite the NFL being 70% Black, um, somehow Black coaches don't seem to be getting, able to get jobs. There's seven openings, and I think, what, one? One. One got a, a job. And we had in the Super Bowl, uh, <laughs> the Super Bowl winner each had the defensive coordinator and the offensive coordinator are Black, and on the other side, the offensive coordinator Black. In the Super Bowl, but somehow I can't get head coaching jobs or get one opportunity. And so, you know, there are always explanations. We see people get opportunities, but there's no criteria that you can look at to say to explain how that happens. There, there's something systemic in that. You know, when people talk about systemic racism, you can call it something else, but that's what we were talking about because somehow there will be somebody who uh, gets an interview 
that was like a third string quarterback getting an interview for a head coaching job, you know? And I think the same job, someone like Jim Caldwell has been in playoffs many, many times is in the same kind of conversation with somebody that, that was like, you know, not even in it. So you can go through all of the criteria and lists and scratch your head and somebody can say, well, this person doesn't interview well, or this person doesn't have, and then you'll magically, there'll be somebody else white who, who, wait a minute, this person doesn't interview well, this person can't hold a press conference. So at some point, the question asks is that you just have to ask the question, why? You know, you know, if let somebody answer that question, if, if you have that, uh, the, the, the population is playing football and you have people who have been successful in other rungs of coaching, but they can't get an opportunity, you have to ask the question, well, well what is that? Absolutely. And, and just, uh, just so that uh, those out there listening know, uh, if you've got questions, please leave them in the chat. We will get to that uh, in a little bit. Uh, but I'm going to keep on feeding you guys this, this, this good stuff from our, our panelists. So uh, bear with us, but we will get to your questions at, at some point uh, fairly soon. Co Coach Mosley, and you, you've got the interesting and unique perspective of being both someone who at an early age worked in the media business as, as a PA. Uh, and you're a coach, you're literally on the other side of the microphone now. Uh, and when it comes to issues involving racism and, and things of that nature, how do those two worlds help shape how you, in your current position, do your job? Knowing that you've been on both the media and the other side of the media spectrum. Well, first of all, I want everyone out there to know that the euphemism creative contributor to those shows as I was a PA. Okay, I was running <laughs> back and forth, but that's what you do on your resume. Okay. Um, but no, so I um I think that it was it's interesting. I, I was there for all of 10 months. Um and I, I learned a lot that you know really it was about making great television, right? It wasn't necessarily about the sports themselves, um, which had what was a really interesting perspective. Um, and, and we were all sports fans that were working there, but we needed to put together a great show. And when you're on the other side of the mic, you're putting on the show that's being captured by the media, right? Um, and when all, everything's going well, you are the star of that show, right? Um, and you're successful and everyone loves you and all that. The moment that things start going awry or you have a losing season or there's some kind of controversy or something of that nature, people flip on you in a heartbeat because that's what sells, right? If it, if it bleeds, it leads. And so um, I think that that's really been an interesting thing for me to make sure that I am doubly conscious of um, when I step in front of a microphone, um, that I am really intentional with my words, that I, I think that my counterparts who um, don't look like me don't necessarily have to have those same thoughts going through their head. and. They have a little bit more um, of, of leeway to, to speak, you know, off the cuff, to make comments to, and it's attributed to, oh, you know, they're just being um, passionate or they, you know, they, they were upset because of, of, of a call or, or something of that where, you know, I could be perceived as an angry black woman, right, who, um, who is, who lost control, right, all the different tropes that are out there. Um, that, that, that can really have a negative connotation. And so I have to be really aware of that. And me as the person that I am, I'm a really passionate person. I, I care about what I'm doing. I'm intense on the court. I love my players to death, but because I love them, I'm gonna get after them too, because I want them to be able to show the best version of themselves every time they take the court. And yeah. I expect excellence, right? Mm -hmm. um, sorry, go ahead. No, they'll keep going, keep going, you're rolling, keep it going. Uh, no, so I just feel like for me, I when you talk about being on this side um, of, of the media and the way that, you know, women, black women are perceived, um, it's enough to, to just that you have to like deal with that, um, the, the notion that you may be somehow too passionate or angry or something like that. Um, but the other part too is this notion that you aren't really as competent 
um, you know, or you're not as proficient in, in the job um, that you just maybe are really a great recruiter, right? Oftentimes we're pigeonholed to just be recruiters and let's go get the kids. And I remember Coach Stringer telling uh, me when the BCA was a thing, not just me, like the, our, our organization at the Final Four my first year, do not get pigeonholed into being just a recruiter. You still need to scout. You still need to, um, you know, do X's and O's. You still need to make sure that you do marketing and um, community service and the academic, like you need to learn how everything works so that when your opportunity comes, you are able to do it all. Um, and I've always really kept that in the, in the forefront of my mind because I wanted to be more than just, you know, a stereotype. I wanted to be the same as my counterparts who are white, whether it's male or females, because we're coaching basketball. That's what we're doing. I'm not a black woman coaching basketball. I'm just a basketball coach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, the, the one thing that, well, quite a few things as you said that really resonated with me, but that, that, that pursuit of excellence uh, is, is something that I think often gets lost uh, when discussing, you know, those who are pushing back against racism, uh, that it's not about you know, being politically correct, it's about being great, being excellent at, at anything and everything. Uh, and then the other point that you brought up, and it's something that I talk to my students a lot about, and so th this is nothing new that they haven't heard before, but having the power to pivot, uh, being a PT peer, putting as many tools as you can in the toolbox, because you never know when you're going to need to, you know, hammer up that, that window frame. You never know when you're going to need to drill bit to, to solidify your door. You never know what skills you're going to acquire that will be necessary for you to get to where you want to be. And that goes not only from a professional standpoint, but also from a personal standpoint, from a, so, from a societal standpoint, uh, understanding how to navigate and move in whatever direction that is necessary. Uh, before we open up the questions, I have one more for Kevin. And uh, Full disclosure, Kevin, uh, when you uh, received your Lifetime Achievement Award at, at uh, NABJ Virtual this past year, um, you I, I still, and I'm not going to do it now because of uh, time restraints, but I actually recorded that uh, because I thought what you said was so amazingly powerful. And I'm just going to read just an excerpt from that. Uh, and you said, quote, sometimes you have to suffer defeat to know who you are, to see what you can rise from that you got knocked down, but then you rose. We have to keep telling our kids that they can be anything in our profession, that there are no barriers, nothing they cannot aspire to, that they can keep rising. It's our time, it's their time. I've, full disclosure, me and my, my kids have had the conversation about this, this very passage and they're like, well, dad, you've kind of been beating us to death with that since we were like four years old. So why are you telling us this now? <laughs> and my whole point is because I want you to, at some point, not just embrace that, but give it to others. That's why I keep hitting you with that. That's why. I, and Kevin, I just wanted to get your thoughts on just why are you so confident that sports can make a difference when it comes to racism? And what does that, like, where does that confidence come from? Even though obviously... We've seen our share of setbacks. We've seen our share of things that, yeah, as you talked about just a little while ago, about the coaching situation in the NFL. We've seen things that don't add up, that there is a certain element of racism involved in, in some way, shape, or form. How are you confident that change will come? Well, look, first of all, it, it's and, and, and thank you for that, um, because we have history, and we come from a long tradition right, of, of what our ancestors put down. And that, you know, when I did do those remarks, um, the introduction of that was from Maya Angelou. That's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, and it comes from, you know, she's the spiritual, I call her the spiritual godmother of the undefeated. That's where the name comes from. You know, that essentially you, you, can, you can be knocked down, you may suffer defeat, but you will not be defeated because that's a state of mind. And so we know, like, I always think about sometimes, and I know that people talk about being trolled on Twitter and, and the outrage of it. And, and, and I'm not for that, but I think about like, well, Thurgood Marshall was traveling down dark roads, you know, um, people hiding him in places, uh, going into all white courtrooms and winning cases uh, under death threats um, and, and like real death threats, uh, not trolling on Twitter. I don't want to underestimate it. And so I always kind of think about that. You, you got to think about the trajectory you know, we're in this profession, Sherrod, and, and there were people covering the Emmett Till trial 
they they didn't have they they had to be get out of town quickly file stories you know couldn't eat every place couldn't sleep places and so i just think it's important to kind of look at the whole trajectory of, of where we came you know we we recently did a documentary um we partnered with nat geo on it's called march uh the march on washington keepers of the dream and it was from looking at the march on washington 63 why they where they gathered in in washington from 63 all the way to 2020 and the the reasons why everybody gathered at that time it was the the largest march you know it was it was a signature thing and and through the course of time from 63 up to 2020 those 57 years there have been a lot of marches marches have been one of the ways in which we push for social change and made our presence felt uh whoever you are right whatever your cause and but it but it really the biggest one started then and and you just have to think about some of the same issues that Dr. King and John Lewis and others, Bayard Rustin, you know, were, were wrestling with and presented to the world then. In, 19, in 2020, there's some of the same issues. Uh, police brutality, uh, vigilantism, um, you know, all kinds of other inequities. And so that, that fight doesn't come, but you have to kind of harken back to the progress that's happened. You know, coach... Coach is sitting there coaching a major Division One program. Um, you're at our university teaching, you know, kids, and so, you know, we are in these places, and and you have to kind of like use that as fuel. You know, I, I look at it back, and and I use all the struggle for people not here, you know, the Ella Bakers and 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 some of the unsung people, to use it as fuel, and and that's how how I look at it. Like like when when I say it's our time, we pass it on to the next kids, your kids, they do more with it than what we did with it. Because, you know, I think John Lewis, um, when John Lewis died, and I wrote something, it's like, John Lewis is no longer here, but we are. We're still here. And so it's up to all of us who are here to, to keep, you know, pushing forward. Absolutely. And, and at, this, at this point in time, I'm going to open it up to some questions. And we've got Decent amount in the queue, nice. Uh, this first question, uh, and this is for both of you. Uh, at the same time that leadership wields tremendous power, we cannot underestimate the grassroots. Local community diverse programs are doing great work and breaking barriers as well. How do you create a powerful partnership between the two for accelerated results? Go ahead, Coach. Okay. Um, well, I think that's a, a great question. I, um, I'm actually on the board of um, an organization called the Shooting Touch, uh, or just Shooting Touch, rather. I keep always calling it the Shooting Touch. Um, but anyway, it's um, based here in Boston, um, but it also has an arm in Rwanda. And I've been able to do quite a bit of work, and it uses basketball as a tool to um, educate young girls um, and women around healthcare, um, you know, uh, disparities within um, our society, um, gender norms, and also um, food education, food security. So there's a lot of things that, that, that the organization, organization does. And I, I, I definitely agree that the grassroots um, organizations are, are so important that you don't necessarily have to have the larger organizations. And oftentimes they really are um, right there on the ground doing the work with, with folks. And to Kevin's point, that you know those are the future right those kids and so if we can empower them and we can educate them and we can expose them to opportunities but also to um, raise their voices and use their platforms that they have um, I think that's so critical and if they can be connected to organizations like universities like BU or to ESPN or, or things of that nature I think that's where we know it's the finances part that usually will drive the the grassroots to be able to have um, you know the opportunities to really will change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kevin, we've got another question that, yeah, I think this one is, yeah, I think this is in your wheelhouse. Uh, it says, uh, the, the person says, I'm on a new DEI at our company and the conversations we're having have been incredible and powerful. Our concern is the next steps. Uh, this individual says that they work for a business media company and most of their jobs are posted via LinkedIn. And the huge percentage of candidates we get are white. Some feel this approach is not necessarily racist, but that it is lazy. Can you offer some recommendations we could slash should talk, take to turn talk of diversity into action? Thank you. Well, look, I, I think when you post jobs, I, 
you know, you know, every, everybody has to post jobs, but I think you have to, to develop relationships, relationships are everything and, and go out and find people, you know, in the same way a coach goes out and recruits. I mean, if I have jobs open, I, I go out and, and reach out and try to find people and, and I'm looking for people we don't have looking for people who are, are different, not the same people we have, but, but, but people we don't have, what, what are, where are our gaps? And I think kind of recognizing what does your culture look like inside a company? What does your population look like? How can you be better? You know, and, and, and with the mindset of not so much everything is like, well, I don't have enough diversity and this and that, but how can you be better? You know, how can you improve, you know? Um, and I just think that that requires going, sometimes going outside your comfort zone, going to find and, and talking to people you haven't talked to building relationships that you haven't built before. And I think that's really what, and, and ultimately you have to make, sometimes just make really tough decisions, break glass and, and, and do things that you haven't done before. Um, and so that's, that's my advice. And could yeah, I get and, in there, Sherrod? Yeah, um, absolutely. So I 100% I agree with Kevin. And I think one of the other things that's really um, striking with in, in this kind of regard is this idea kind of goes back to the whole third string quarterback getting a, an opportunity and, you know, a seasoned and experienced, you know, offensive or defensive coordinator who's black, right? It's this idea somehow that we can take chances on, um, you know, white individuals who don't have as much experience, but we somehow can't do the same for people of color. And so, um, you know, you do have to go outside your warehouse, you know, there, there, it also has to be that there's not this idea Idea that we're just going to fill a quota or we're just going to like like give away this opportunity right but these are earned right people have, have the qualifications you have to be willing to give them the opportunity that they're qualified and I think you know that's oftentimes lost in this right it's this idea that somehow it's a gift or something of that nature nobody's looking for a handout they're looking for an opportunity and those two things are different yeah and, nope. and, and just and, right and, and just real quick uh in my role with the National Association of Black Journal Sports Task Force, I spent a lot of time talking with different executives with companies about diversity, about ways that they can amplify that component of their industry. And what I always come back to uh, when all said and done is, are you willing to do the right thing? Now, the right thing doesn't mean that you bring in a bunch of people of color. It means creating opportunities so that you can at least give them an opportunity to prove themselves. Uh, there's a young man at uh, ESPN now by the name of Eric Woodyard. Uh, and he was in Salt Lake, well, he was in Michigan and a sports editor from Salt Lake City called me and said, I'm down to him and another guy for this job. You got a few minutes to tell me why I should hire him. I spent an hour and a half talking why this guy should be the one that they hire. He went there got a couple of awards, a couple of years later, he's at ESPN. You have to have people who are allies, advocates, and open-minded about the process when it comes to diversity. Uh, and, and, and really, you know, we're talking about racism and how sports can, and, and, and just how to be anti-racist, but diversity is a major component under that umbrella. Uh, and that's really what a lot of this comes back to, is just having an open, diverse mind and approach to the industry, not only in terms of sports, but all just in life in general. So, uh, Kevin, you're about to say something. No, I was just going to say that, that that Bob Iger at our place, our executive chairman at, at Disney, you know, likes to say we we overvalue experience and undervalue talent. Mm. And and when you get into that matrix, because there hasn't been a lot of opportunity, you know, for for us, then we don't have the experience, and that sometimes rules out hiring people for. For, for talent, their talent and potential. And, and so I, I think that's really important. I think sometimes I like to say that everybody's looking for Jackie Robbins, you know, th that perfect person who can, can come in and is, you know, is, 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 is they're sure is not gonna mess up as though they have to carry the whole race on their back. And, and that's, that's one of the fallacy. I think that's ingrained into a lot of hiring. It's like, like not wanting to take, as Marissa said, not wanting to take chances on people, you know? Um, you know, even if you, you, you see somebody and you think, well, I'm not sure, take a chance on somebody. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too, just one other thing to answer that question is 
the, the way that jobs are written, right? Job descriptions are so important and that can, you need to be anti-racist in the way that you write your job descriptions because I think it's critical um, to in order not to, to attract a more diverse group of candidates to understand that you are, you know, you fit this description as well. And if you don't fit it to a T, how many times do we know are, you know, people who, who don't look like us will apply for a job anyway when they don't have those qualifications, right? So I think that's really important as well. Absolutely. Uh, we got time for a few more questions. Of uh, uh, Next one, we've got, how should allies help in the medium of sports television without coming off as fake? Is it better for people in that situation to just stay quiet and listen? I'm thinking specifically of Kirk Herbstreet on college football getting emotional and not feeling genuine. Kevin, go for it. <laughs> you know, look, I I think, I mean, I felt like Kirk Herbstreet was coming from a place, just to speak on that, that he, you know, he's somebody who has uh, a lot of influence with an audience, very popular one, you know, Sherrod probably knows this even better than me, you know, I think one, sports broadcast a year more times than than anybody in yeah. terms of the, the Emmys. And so I think he felt like he, he needed to, to speak up. And I think that came from a genuine place. I, I didn't have any problem. I think a lot of people applauded him. I think people should feel, do what they feel authentically driven and not worry about, well, will I be seen this way or that way? If you're, if you're really authentic and coming from an authentic place, then, then, yeah, step out there, you know, and, and do what you are authentically driven to do, you know? And, and I think sometimes, sure, you, you're, you're in the age we're in, you're always going to have people that question it and, and challenge it. But if it's really you, you, you shouldn't really worry about it. Yeah, I agree too. I think it's, a, you know, this idea of cancel culture or people trolling and all of the, you know, it's given, um, you know, rise to so many folks just um, being kind of, uh, skeptical of everybody, right? No one can be, no one's authentic anymore in, in, in somebody's eyes, right? There's always some angle. And I, I agree, if you're, if you feel authentic and, and, you know, or you are being authentic and you feel strongly about something, you speak on it, then you should be confident that, you know, it came from a good place. And I think that we have to stop being so critical of everyone, because also how do we actually move forward and affect change if we're not giving people the opportunity to be different than they were before? So it, it's, kind of like you, you can't have it both ways all right and this this question is, is for, for either one of you uh specifically you coach how can i as an athlete in person with working in a predominantly white sport be a better ally i am so passionate about hockey but find its lack of diversity and lack of initiative on racial issues extremely disheartening uh, okay uh so i would say um Educate yourself would be the first thing, right? There are books, there are videos, there are conversations that you can have. I think, you know, a lot that I've learned um, that people are looking for over this year is to be told how they can help, right? And to and and they're putting the onus back on the folks who have for so long had to be the consummate educators. And so I would say, do the work on your own and be become more educated so then you can have conversations and then you can ask you know informed questions right it's not just tell me how i can be better right and like go but more like i was reading about this topic or i you know this in history or i you know I, I was just learning about black wall street let's talk you know what i mean like let's have some really um you know meaningful conversations and i think in that way that's how you can be an ally or co-conspirator, right? If you're just looking to check a box off or feel like have a feel good moment or put up a black square on Instagram for a day, I don't have really time for for that. That to me is inauthentic then. And, right. And, and, and just, that for me has been one of the challenges of discerning between that individual and someone who's genuinely interested in trying to elevate their, their thought on this particular subject matter. Uh, trying oh, to- Sorry, could I say one other thing? I'm sorry, I don't mean to mm -hmm. cut off. One other thing I would say in when you talk about a sport like hockey that is predominantly white is you can also use your experience and your expertise to expose people who don't generally have um, the experience to the sport, right? So how do you change it? Will you bring people who don't look like you into the sport? Like we talk about the grassroots. 
offering, right? Hockey, uh, ice time is expensive. The gear is expensive. The sticks are expensive, all that kind of stuff. That's not saying that black people can't afford to play it, but, but where we see the majority of the folks playing hockey are in more affluent areas. So how can you use that um, opportunity to expose kids? And again, the exposure, the opportunity can lead to the success. Yeah. I just want to double down on what coach just said there. And I think the NHL has a program where like ball hockey, they were, they were inter introducing hockey into urban areas and, and taking over tennis courts and I mean, basketball courts and just exposing them to the game, right? Even if you don't have the ice, which we know is in short supply. Uh, but I, I think any way to get people to, to, to look at things that they haven't had a chance to look at, you know, because that's again, opportunity. And, and if they get opportunity, who's to say what will happen with that opportunity? Exactly, exactly. Uh, a couple got time for a couple more questions. This next one, uh, this is someone actually who works here at, at BU. Uh, I am working with students in our BU Upward Bound program that are preparing for college. Some may be on this call. How did going to college put you in position to impact change? And let me, and I'll, I'll jump on this one right off the bat because I'm familiar with the Upward Bound program. When I was in Syracuse, New York, and I was a part of that program back when I had this idea of being a chemical engineer, which is a long story that we ain't got time for. Um, but programs like that are part of the process of impact and change. Being around like-minded individuals whose goal is to elevate wherever they are now, not focusing on where you are, but where you wanna go, where, where do you need to be? Uh, and being provided the tools to get there. Uh, college was the best thing that, have, that ever happened to me in life. Uh, one, I went for free, which is always good. I, I strongly encourage anyone out there, if you can do that, do that. Uh, my kids, unfortunately, did not heed my words. Another story, another day. But uh, get college opened my eyes, not only in terms of my job, but also just in terms of my own personal growth. Uh, I, I went to a predominantly white institution and there were a number of race, racist issues and incidents that I had dealt with. Uh, I didn't always deal with them the best way I should have, uh, but I learned in time how to better handle those situations. And I grew, I matured, I, I did what all of us do. I grew up uh, and that's part of, for me, that's part a big part of what, what college did for me. It just allowed me to grow up and understand how to be, uh, you know, someone who is all about dream catching and not dream snatching with myself and others. Yeah, I would say my mom is actually um, Upward Bound alum and uh, she came, she did Upward Bound at UMass and that's where she met her first black friends at 15. She didn't know black people. She's from the Berkshires. There was one black family in the town in Cheshire and she didn't know them like, you know, personally. And so that definitely her experience then impacted my experience. Not only that going to college was expected right off the bat that we were going to go to college. That's they spoke that into existence from when we were a kid, you know, you're talking about hammering that into your children. We were just, go, we were going to go to college. That was a foregone conclusion. And, you know, I can't tell you how many people said, um, well, you finished in four years. Like that was also a foregone conclusion. You were going to be done in four years. There wasn't going to be, and, and nothing, you know, no disrespect to anyone who took longer. That was just the expectation that was set by my parents. Um, going to college though, absolutely gave me a confidence and a, and a great base right? I mean, I was again a minority at a, at a BU. And so I'm in classrooms and I'm in discussions and I'm in arenas where um, I was in the minority and I had to be able to kind of grow and um, excel in those places to make sure that I wasn't left behind. And so now as I come into my, you know, adult years, I have been in those places where I needed to be able to speak up, be confident and, um, and to Kevin's point before, speak truth to power, knowing that I have the backing, I have the education, I have the degree to stand on and say, um, you know, I, I, I'm prepared or, you know, I'm experienced enough to say so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, Kevin, uh, I know we're short on time, but I, I, I had to get this question in because uh, purely selfish reasons, it's about my kids. Uh, not the biological tax deductible ones, but the ones I teach here at BU. Uh, we have a number of students watching this right now, uh, 15 of whom are my students. Uh, the majority of them want to, in some fashion, be involved in a world of sports journalism. What advice would you give them on how to handle racism 
in their professional workplace. Somehow was on mute. Um, I, I think that it, it's all. It's. I, I'm not sure that there is a a single way to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at it like the best thing you can do for yourself is just just be really good. You know, work on your game. Be excellent. You know, let that be your armor. You know, excellence is your armor. You know, um, and when you're really good, options open for you. And then you can look at people and say, you're crazy, you know, I'm, I'm good, you know. Uh, and, I, and I think that really is, is your steal, you know. Uh, be great, you know, go in, go in the gym, you know, like Kobe Bryant, work on your, your shot, you know, work hard, outwork people, and just really be great. And I, and I think, you know, that's going to be really your, your calling card. Um, you know, I also think of one thing. I was in this conversation today we had with the whole Disney group, it was about the complexities of race and achievement, uh, racial identity and achievement. And I was um, watching some of my people uh, talk about this. And, and one of the things that um, Soraya McDonald, who's a culture critic for The Undefeated, had said that, you know, and I wrote it down, you know, she says that, you know, there's more to, to blackness than just enduring racism. And sometimes people want to just frame us as, this is, this is our whole experience and we have to be caught up in that. And, 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 and to that same thing, Toni Morrison said this some years ago, we played a clip of this, where people are always not really giving her props. It was a long time before she won a Nobel Prize and won awards. And she was doing this work and writing these great books and they were being consumed, but, but she's writing about our lives. You know, she was focused on elevating our lives and people said, well, you know, you don't write about other things. You can't really, you know, get into the mainstream of stuff. And, and, and what she had said was that, you know, like as, as if our lives have no meaning or depth without the white gaze. And, and I do think that that's important, that, that everything that we do doesn't have to be, have a racial filter and, and, a, and complication. We can, we can like, you know what, I'm just going to go out here, be great. As, and let's say I'm going to be the best coach and let other people you know, let me, let me shake other people off with that. Absolutely. Uh, before we, uh, we're, we're going to be wrapping up fairly soon. Just want to mention that our, our next uh, Calm Talk will be March 3rd. Uh, there is a link to that information at bu.edu slash calm. Uh, check that out. It'll be focused on just uh, mint or networking with calm alums. That'll be 3 to 4 p.m. on March 3rd. So please check that out. And before we go, because I know we only got a couple more minutes, um, is there, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to put this, uh, what, if you could just kind of do, look into a crystal ball and you could predict the future, you could predict it accurately. What, is there one thing or event that you think could just be a game changer in the fight against racism? Go ahead, coach. Oh, for really Kevin. <laughs> Kevin playing that point guard spot. Okay. I know. I know. Um, okay. I'm, I promise I'm going to make the shot. Um, one event, I think, um, well, I, I have to say this because there, there is this idea that the NBA has led the, the way um, on all of this work this summer and the WNBA have been in the forefront for, for a long time. So just leave it to black women and um, we, we, will take, we will take you home. Um, but I, I do think that um, there is no one singular event because this is not a singular issue. It is so interconnected. Um, and so I do think that um, Kevin made a point earlier that really kind of has resonated with me and, and has driven me, right? Um, and it's a line from Hamilton, you know, you, can, you need to be in the room when it happens, mm. right? And so we need to have seats at the table or build a table and bring your chair or whatever it is, but you've got to be in the room. And I think that needs to happen in all industries. Um, it, that we, when, when that happens, I think we can really affect change because th that's, those are the decision makers. And, and that's when you can, you know, use the power um, that you have. And power isn't in the game. Money 
win power are the name of the games. And if we can um, somehow put that in that crystal ball, that's a lot to ask. But like you said, it's a crystal ball. So, you know, you make we make things happen. Kevin, over to you. You know what I'm going to say? Lean into black women. My, my, that, that's my answer. You know what? My, my grandson, after uh, it was a little videotape and and he said, thank you, black women. You know, that was that was something that he said. And, and, it, and it, it encompassed so many things. Right. Like raising our kids. Um, what Marissa said about the, what the women of the WNBA did, you know, uh, on, on a center race, by the way, and taking some ownership league, the, the, the current U.S. senator, you know, from Georgia was polling like a 9% before the WNBA got in and they got together and that's where they brought allies. It's a, it's an 80% black league or 85%, whatever it is, Marissa knows, but they brought everybody together. That's, that's, and, and you could just see how they do things, you know, and, and I could, I could go through the whole thing. Like I tell the, the, the people who run the undefeated, really, I'm the editor in chief, black women, you know, they, they're everywhere. And, and, and that's, you know, it's, that's, that's my unconventional note for the day. Leaning on black women, and that's, you know, you'll probably be good there. Yeah, and, and just, yeah. And, and, yeah, when, when Kevin speaks about just the leadership at the undefeated, he's not just going to smoke up, up, up you. Uh, Monique Jones, for example, comes to mind who as, I mean, that, even though she's younger than me, she's really like my big sis, uh, because that's, the, that's how powerful and strong she is and what she does. Uh, and, and that, to me, is part of the strength of this discussion. This was powerful and strong because I got Mr. Kevin Merida, Coach Mosley. Uh, we are out of time. I want to make sure that folks definitely uh, know that this is being recorded and it will be available uh, relatively soon, uh, bu.edu slash com. Uh, and also just a reminder about our next uh, com talk will be you know, uh, Uncertain Job Market Networking with Com Alums, and that will be, again, on March 3rd, 3 to 4 p.m. Uh, so definitely check that out on the Com calendar as well. Uh, and again, for our esteemed panelists, Kevin Merida, Coach Marissa Mosley, thank you so much for your time. And uh, for all you out there, uh, have, a, have a wonderful, blessed day. And stay safe. Stay safe. Thank, thank you. you, Shira. Thank you so much. Thanks, Coach. See you, Kev. All right.